Um, welcome everyone. We're going to kickstart this session. Uh, it's an honor to have Anisha with us and uh, he'll talk about Kiran Thomas in a minute, but uh, we will uh, get started. Uh, this is this is going to be more of a fireside chat. It's going to be a free-flowing, uh, open, honest uh, conversation. Uh, you know, it's going to be impromptu, so we don't know how where we will go. But it's a bit of an exploration. Uh, you know, I've I've been really fortunate over the last two years. I've been working very closely with Anish and Kiran. Uh, and I would say, uh, rarely in my career, I have uh, met executives who not only deal with the uh, strategy of a $70 billion company, uh, you know, a five-year-old company, which is now uh, worth $70 billion, and uh, go all the way. Uh, I've seen I've seen Anish and Kiran go all the way to uh, at the code level and even do dive, uh, live debugging where required. You know, in a nutshell, I think for me, uh, working with them, what I've come to realize is uh, Anish and Kiran are core engineers at heart, and uh, they are the key people driving India's digital roadmap. So it's such an honor to have uh, have you here with us, uh, Anish. And uh, I think what I want to do is, uh, I don't want to turn this into uh, a session where we spend the next uh, maybe two days just talking about Geo's accomplishment, because I honestly, you know, 45 minutes, uh, you know, session won't do justice. But uh, Geo has touched all of us uh, in many different ways, and we've actually experienced the Geo way in, in some sense. So, so we'll focus here a little bit on uh, your leadership style, uh, the the unique Geo's culture, and the organization, and uh, more importantly, getting to know you a little bit better in a bit of an informal setting. Uh, with your permission, if that's okay, I, I think we will we will take that as an approach for today. First of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Naresh, and uh, I'm sure uh, the team uh, who has worked with you to make this happen. It's a fabulous uh, uh, accomplishment of the things to be done virtually and still, you know, able to uh, uh, make it so successful. So uh, I would say congratulations to you and the team. Uh, also, I want to uh, say that, you know, today uh, I am going to talk on behalf. I was not aware that it is a free talk. Uh, uh, in any case, I have not made any PPTs or presentation. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm all open and I'm ready to take some of these questions. I don't know how surprising they are, but I'm ready to do it. I also want to admit that today uh, I'm going to talk on behalf of uh, uh, Anish, that is myself and Kiran, uh, who is my uh, partner uh, in crime or whatever you call it as uh, we have been uh, uh, both both me and Kiran have been working uh, now for almost 25 years uh, together and uh, each one of us have uh, been, uh, I mean, I'm fortunate uh, to have a partner like Kiran uh, to associate with him uh, for, I mean, he has deep expertise in so many areas uh, that I always get inspired uh, whenever I uh, interact with him and probably on a daily basis, I learn a lot from him. Unfortunately, he has uh, some personal uh, work and uh, uh, he's not able to join, but uh, I have taken his permission and uh, I think on his behalf, I'm going to uh, uh, answer some of the questions. I don't know how good I'll be, but I'll try it. I'm sure, I'm sure you will uh, exceed our expectations. So uh, with that, let's kind of uh, dive in straight. Uh, <clears throat> One thing that uh, has amazed me, and I want to I want to start with that is is the analogies uh, that that uh, you guys give uh, in in a lot of your review meetings and so forth. And uh, you know, people say a, a picture is worth thousand words. I would say an analogy or a or a, or a dialogue that you guys uh, make is probably worth worth similarly a thousand words. Uh, and sometimes when you use these uh, dialogues so impromptu. Uh, you know, just that one phrase basically hits the nail on the head. And so uh, I want to I want to maybe uh, pick a couple of those dialogues and kind of uh, get the uh, get a little bit of the context and the story behind some of those dialogues. So Anisha, one of uh, my favorite dialogues of you has been uh, Operation Successful, Patient Dead. Uh, can you tell us what this means and what's the story behind this? Uh uh, oh, so uh, you have picked up a, a very uh, important, but a very uh, uh, critical phrase of I, I, I. Yes, I do 
do it in my day to day things when i am interacting with uh, my teams and uh, some of uh, our leaders uh, I, i i think it is very contextual and thanks for asking this uh, i don't know uh, how how this uh, is related to others but i think to our teams it relates very well uh, in terms of when you say uh, i mean this this is a phrase which i have uh, i mean practically experienced in what we do and that's why i i i mentioned this quite a lot to the team and i think uh, it relates very well that operations is successful and patient is dead uh, i think it is trying to tell that you know you have to be focusing on your outcome all the time uh, it is not important that you do a visioning exercise or a strategy exercise at the start of whatever you do and then you forget and then you start go so engrossed in building that that you are not looking at the outcome or the direction to reach that outcome uh, it is it is the way to look outside in every time all the time whatever you are doing whatever you are building uh, and sometimes uh, this phrase is very relevant because you might at the end of everything you might say oh i have got the great platform it is now complete it is all true but you might not see even a single customer on, on top of it or uh, you might uh, realize that you know you are pretty late in the game uh, because somebody else has already done the work so i think uh, uh, it it talks about agility it talks about looking at the outcome all the time uh, it also it also uh, correlates to saying that how should you execute your project uh, you cannot be engraved in uh, in 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 doing things whatever you are building whether it is uh, identifying a technology or you are uh, trying to build a platform or, or for that matter you are just integrating some services that you are forgetting the outcome so to me i think uh, you have to be very clear that while you are uh, doing your operations and uh, in this analogy it is that when you are looking at when you are doing your operations uh, you should ensure that the patient is alive you should always see that the patient is uh, is 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 able to do everything what he is supposed to do while you are doing operations and to that point uh, you should ensure that when you say that your operations is successful the patient has to be smiling happy uh, and and should be really uh, really proud of that you know now he is able to do what he is doing and i think that is the uh, analogy uh, probably i provide uh, in in my context otherwise sometimes i have seen that some of my tech leaders uh, some of my process leaders they got so engraved uh, they get so get into the bookish part of execution that they sometimes uh, forget the outcome uh, they sometimes don't correlate to what they are trying to do and it's quite likely that you might uh, miss the target uh, you you will you will forget what you are actually trying to build uh, and and being agile is one of the important element of this that uh, while you are doing agile uh, you should always look at your outcome are you meeting your outcome are you constantly moving in that direction so i think that is the reason i use this phrase um uh, i didn't know that somebody is catching this phrase in this manner but thanks for asking and uh, i i i just clarify <laughs> no, but it's always amazing when i've seen when you've used this it it really uh, has an impact on people so I, i i really like that there's a similar another phrase let's uh, let's go to that anish if you don't mind that is uh, i've i've seen uh, uh, you know uh, you and a lot of uh, senior leaders uh, executive leaders at geo use this take me seriously but not literally uh, what what does this phrase mean like yeah so i think uh, i mean this is a, 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 a phrase which uh, my colleague kiran uses quite often uh, that take me uh, seriously and not literally and i think uh, again it has a very uh, deep meaning uh, sometimes uh, you know people uh, try to go to the t of what they are trying to do uh, take me seriously and not literally is that we don't have to be so uh, focused in, in in delivering outcome that we forget what we want to do for our customers i mean if we have to do something different from what we had thought initially because we believe that that is true for customers or that is right for customers then we should go ahead and uh, you know we should execute that we should be ready to prepare to be out of what we had decided initially it's quite possible that uh, in the initial stage we might have thought about something but as you move as you go towards the execution of project or at the time of delivery you might realize that you know there are certain things which are not right or you have to do it you cannot say that you know because i had thought about this or i had visioned this i have to do it you have to you should not take anybody so seriously as so literally that if he ask you to walk on the tight rope you will actually start walking all it means is that you need to be very clear of what you want to do and i think i think that is the 
essence of saying take me seriously so you should customer obsession or for that matter whatever you are building has to be there element of what you are doing but that doesn't mean that you have to stick to the t and if it means that you know you are uh, not doing something right for the customer and you still continue to do because you had thought initially i think you should be ready to make those changes you should be uh, ready to accept those changes you should be ready to accept if somebody is even criticizing that is very important and you should uh, do it in that spirit uh don't and, and and that is why kiran because at times he gives so many analogy uh, and he express some things that people sometimes and english uh, as you know is a very funny language uh so so you should not you should not take those meaning in that literal sense you should understand the meaning the 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 expression or the emotions behind that and not the literal word or the literal meaning of that i think that is the essence of what we try to say okay brilliant brilliant uh, and uh, interestingly in this you mentioned about uh, customer obsession and that's that's one area i wanted to touch upon uh, i'll be honest uh, before starting to work with jio one of the things i always thought i mean or felt that jio actually doesn't really care about end customer experience uh, you know this is a perception i had i would say uh and of course now that i've been uh, working very closely with you guys for two years i realized i was quite wrong and it's actually quite the opposite uh but i remember the other day uh, you know uh, kiran was a bit upset with uh, a decision one of the team had made and he was trying to uh, you know express saying that doesn't your blood boil when you see this type of a customer experience uh, or for that matter uh, some of the policies that i think i have seen on the telecom side where it's it's very much in favor of the, in the customers and so you know when when i think about customer obsession i had a i had a a definition in my head what customer obsession means and a lot of that uh, you know i think understanding what you guys are doing has helped me uh, evolve it help it refine it uh, and uh, so so my question to you was uh, you know generally uh, i see that founders entrepreneurs uh, senior leaders uh, in company you know deeply care about their users their customers their partners uh, but you know i have often seen that they struggle to pass the same passion or obsession customer obsession to the rest of their team so uh, can you uh, can you help us understand how you tackle this uh, you know with with your teams certainly first of all i would i would like to admit that you are a excellent observer and an analyzer i didn't realize that you are catching uh, some of these uh, very fundamental elements of what we do in our day to day conversation but i am glad that you are bringing some of these points because first of all i think uh, we will take it very uh, very truly to say that you know uh, we want to uh, we want to make an effort to real make people feel that you know not only internally but we are truly uh, truly customer obsession and i think uh, customer obsession is is not a external trait it is part of our dna uh, and it comes from right from our chairman i mean right from our chairman to the to the last person in the organization uh, i think we strive on uh, customer obsession and several examples uh, i don't want to take too much of time but i'll definitely illustrate by uh, two three specific points to say that how we are customer obsessed and uh, i think uh, i think uh, customer obsession doesn't come by expressing it in the form of words or thing it has to be expressed in the form of an action and i think that was the reason uh, again i'm just correlating uh, your point and i know uh, that instance when Ken was articulating that uh, to some of our colleagues to say that doesn't your blood boil i think it is all about saying that you know how can you tolerate uh, something for our customers and uh, if if your bl- blood is not boiling uh, for your customers then there is something wrong probably you are not in the right place or you are not in the right organization i think that is what uh, the connotation is and i uh, definitely and distinctively remember that episode but i think in general i think customer obsession like i said is a is a part of our dna it is not an external trait or it is not an external thought which we are trying to imbibe uh, it 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 starts like i said it stems from from the apex from the top and it goes all the way to our roots uh, it has to be there because we believe that uh, any organization which has to be a consumer friendly organization if it is not customer obsessed then 
then i don't think so it can be successful our our the the fact that we are successful in the shortest possible time and we are able to provide the best in class service is one reason if i have to attribute is our customer obsessiveness and uh, it it cannot be better than uh, it, this customer obsessiveness uh, cannot be better driven uh, unless it is driven from the top and our chairman uh, i would say himself is so customer obsessed that uh, just to illustrate uh, when we started our service in 2016 uh, 2016 when we launched the services uh, in fact we did almost one and half year of uh, trial trial which was not seen by any end customer but we did trial of our 4g services everything was launched all our towers were radiating we had mobile phones all our services were on but we didn't we didn't release those services until we were very sure of each and every aspect of it of course it was costing huge effort time resource money but we said that we are not going to do it until we are confident of all our systems and you will be surprised that we were not left even single service to be tested we didn't leave anything to chance including our reporting to our regulatory services which generally is an offline work but we said no we want to ensure that 100% of everything is fully tested and it is not about testing applications or qa testing or products and testing it is actually live testing with customers but these were all friendly customers these were all our family members our own internal teams all our hundreds and thousands of it in fact within reliance corporate park we were doing continuous testing every day we used to provision thousands of uh, customers and then we used to delete those customers again we used to provide. so it was like testing 100% of each and every element of our system i mean there cannot be so much of customer obsessiveness the height is that after we launched which was in 2017 when uh, mdl launched uh, the actual uh, thing uh, after the agm we gave this service almost for 180 days plus free to all our customers the service was open live given to our customers 4g service all applications devices everything i mean the sim was given free just walk in give your ekyc and then you know walk out with a working sim with all the applications loaded uh, using that i mean there cannot be a better example of customer obsessiveness the reason why we wanted to do is we wanted to be so perfect so perfect that nothing should go wrong and i think the result of that was and within the, the the day we said that we will convert from free to paid almost 80% of the customers who were using free service got converted in less than 7 days into paid and the remaining 20% got converted into almost 4 uh, weeks so imagine the kind of power which we created of saying that you know we were i i have never seen any organization so customer obsessive to say that until service is perfect until each and every element element which are not directly associated with customer has to be so perfect that we will not launch the service i mean there cannot be better example than saying that and this comes like i said from the top to the bottom each and every team and i think now that inculcates as a part of our dna it comes so natural that we don't have to think uh, and and probably there are several examples but i i don't want to take too much of time so now that uh, that's a fantastic example anish of uh, you know how you guys go over and beyond to ensure uh, first dog fooding it yourself and then kind of uh, giving it to the customers and making sure that until it's perfected you don't start billing them uh, and then that obviously shows in the results that you talked about in terms of the conversions and you know the the growing business that you have so that's that's fantastic there's something about this that that intrigues me is is what you're saying is before you actually launched almost a year and a year ago you had things ready which means you are looking at things far ahead and uh, and you're trying to prepare for for the future so this takes me a little bit to uh, you know uh, i'm sure you've read uh, uh, you've read this book called anti fragile from mm-hmm. nasir talib uh, yes. and one of one of uh, his core principles he talks about is this concept of optionality uh, right which is basically you uh, you want to keep your options open and you want to decide at the last responsible moment and uh, for for the agile practitioners here in the audience i i, I think 
uh, we all believe that we practice this this principle of optionality we we run an iteration or we run an experiment and we defer making decisions or commitments till we actually see some progress or if it is uh, you know in on the architecture side we we believe in evolutionary architecture we don't start with an upfront design of a big bang uh, solution right until we fully understood the problem the challenge i see there is we end up doing this sequentially one after another we finish an experiment then we start another experiment however with uh, with you know there is a concept called set based design uh, which sometimes is also referred to as uh, set based concurrent engineering uh, where you run these experiments in parallel at a rapid scale uh, so that you can amplify your learning and decision making uh, and probably that is something that uh, you know is is one of the things i see as an integral part of how uh, geo has been operating uh, you know even though we know that from lean product development since 1987 if i'm not wrong uh, this is this is one of the core principles but very few companies uh, actually practice uh, concurrent engineering and i and at geo i've seen several examples where this uh, you know this is a part of your core initiative uh, and and that probably explains to me some something that you just briefly talked about but but that's a very intriguing topic so i would like to go a little bit into it if, with your permission if you can give give a couple of examples of how how this actually came to be part of the culture and what kind of benefits have you seen uh, with concurrent engineering uh, i i wish uh, kiran was there because uh, i mean both me and kiran have been talking about this uh, multiple times and one of the philosophy which uh, i think even our chairman talks about and uh, kiran uh, have been uh, pioneering this is you know we should always uh, walk on multi leg i mean we should be like a ant with multiple legs to walk uh, so that even if uh, 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 you know at the like you said you know at the uh, we want to do everything concurrently we want to do everything in parallel uh, several examples but uh, again you know let me illustrate because i think giving example can uh, make uh, people understand what i mean uh, one of the important uh, part of doing this concurrent and Uh, yes i have read the book and probably what uh, it talks about but i think putting in practice is a slightly different thing people have to really uh, put that in practice i mean theory theoretically yes it makes sense but how do you put in practice is very important and i'll give one example that you know uh, we were uh, we have uh, one of a, a, a very successful app called geopos which is used for onboarding uh, millions of uh, re, uh, customers on it on a on a monthly basis and probably at some point in time we used to onboard almost a million customer a day uh, that was the peak time uh, and and even now uh, we uh, we onboard almost uh, uh, 10 million customers a month so that's the kind of uh, uh, kind of thing the pos is and probably we have uh, thousands of retailers who are using this pos uh, i think uh, what we decided you know there were some of the features which we wanted to build and logically one would have thought that you know it's an extension of the same pos so why don't we build those features in the pos but uh, i'm again this is uh, uh, the way kiran and i think and uh, it was kiran who who then said that you know why don't we make a parallel application uh, in a, in normal sense one would have thought oh why should we make a, a separate application in fact it was a separate team uh, uh, and a similar application and we we named it as geopos light Uh, it does almost uh, similar things but it was kept uh, it was thought for making it uh, as a as a paw, as an extension of pos but it does everything what a pos does done by a separate team built on a completely cloud native framework uh, today uh, both geo pos and geo pos light are running together uh, we see now a lot of elements which we have built in pos light Uh, we are also now trying to put it in pos i mean logically i would have said that you know let us go and make one more feature and add it into it because it's the same retailer or similar set of people but we said no why don't we make in parallel and 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 this was this was not an afterthought this was very clearly when the pos was getting built and a lot of features were being added we said that let's build in parallel because uh, we don't have time and uh, and 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 the good part was uh, it really helped during pandemic in pandemic uh, the retailers were physically not available uh, the the pos light app, the pos application was practically impossible for people to use it because the stores were down 
uh, what we did was we converted this light version on the app store and we asked the same retailers to download the, this POS light application and remotely sitting at their home they were able to recharge for their customers now it it became so popular that now we have started saying that okay let these two app run continuously and in a way uh, we run uh, 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 challenging things in both the apps uh, we start building some of the capabilities in both the apps and for us it is it is not one versus other but it is actually helping us to build more and more customer base helping us to do more recharge helping us to do more acquisition and uh, depending on who the retailer is, is or what kind of retailer is, is now we have started positioning uh, uh, POS light versus POS. Again, this was concurrent engineering, two different teams building on the same backend with a different stack and uh, kind of capabilities which was almost overlapping. Now, no insane, no sand guy would, would always think of uh, building a separate team doing this. But we gave this challenge to one of the team who was already building uh, who had already got most of the ingredients or components available with them, saying that, why don't you guys try out and make, make a POS which is better than it and it can be available to anybody and everybody and tomorrow any person who wants to become a retailer can become a retailer. So I think these ideas, and this is one example, but several examples where we have done, even in network, even in areas where, where, where we have to build things, we always want to build redundancy. We always want to build uh, concurrency. We always want to say that let's try both options, three options, four options. And the option, which is final uh, at the end, when, when we have to re really take decision, we will say, okay, what makes sense? Let's go ahead and implement. Uh, it's not that. Uh, one versus other, but then we always take a very, very practical, fragmented call to say that, you know, uh, we want uh, this service as opposed to any other service. So I think that has been, that has been uh, probably the kind of thinking all along in everything which we do. Uh, this is one example only on the system side and application side, but it is true in, in everything which we build, whether it is hardware, whether it is software, whether it is services, we will always try to do it in multiple sense so that, you know, at the end of it, we don't have to worry uh, if one thing fails because we already ha always have an alternative to look upon for. And you never know what will happen, especially when you want to do things at scale. You know, things can go wrong at any point in time. And that's why we don't want to take chance. Again, uh, this is, if you think about it, it is part of uh, an element which is driving us from a customer obsession perspective. We have never fail in In any manner, in whichever way, we want to do that. So I think that is one of the reasons why uh, we do this and we practice this and we practice it and it, it takes a lot of effort uh, to run this. But then now we have realized that, you know, uh, people talk about hackathon. Our hackathon is constantly. Hota hai. Do team ko banane ko bolte hai aur fir do team, char team kabhi kabhi banati hai. Aur jiska thik hota hai, usko chalate hai, baagi sabko bolte hai, teri asset ko hum log reuse karte hai. So this happens all along. It is not an uh, one, one time episode, but all along. Yeah, absolutely. Like this, <clears throat> this is like a hackathon culture that's just constantly running in the company. And this creates so much of uh, this muscle power, if you will, in terms of ability to move very quickly. And right. so I think that's, that's a pretty interesting point. I think you've been talking a lot about uh, Kiran. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here. But uh, I want to highlight uh, one other thing that, that really struck me. Uh, and I'm still amazed. Uh, is about your leadership style, uh, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, both of you, you and Kiran come with a massive experience uh, backing you. Uh, but majority of the time, I find both of you uh, together guiding the teams, together making decisions. Uh, in fact, before pandemic, both of you used to sit next to each other. Uh, and often, like Kiran would start a statement and uh, Anish, you would complete it. Or there are times when Kiran would ask a question and you will build on top of it. Like uh, the kind of synergy that I've seen between the two of you, I, I mean, personally, I've not seen in any leader. Uh, if I were to relate this back to the folks in the audience, if you're familiar with the concept of pair programming in extreme programming, uh, you know, where two developers are uh, working together on the same computer, trying to sell, solve the same problem. Uh, or for that matter, pair coaching where two coaches, you know, work together to coach a team. Uh, you know, if you see Anish and Kiran in action, they are very much like that. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of uh, 
you know the like a you know two in a box is what i call it <laughs> two two in a box leader right leadership style uh, which is quite unique at at this scale of the organization at the level where you guys are uh, generally you only get one <laughs> and you have to you know work with that but in this case we get two and and both of you have uh, such rich experience that you can guide the team uh, you know uh so how how did how did you discover this and uh, you know how did you start with this like i'm i'm just curious i i am so amazed that you you do very very deep uh, observation and uh, thanks for bringing this point uh I, I, in retail there is a term called bogof uh, uh it is called bogof buy one get one free <laughs> so uh yeah jokingly yeah. but i think uh, i think uh, uh, again Uh, uh if you if you see the bollywood industry uh, bollywood industry especially uh, the in in music uh, you will always find that there are uh, there are always a duo uh, I, i think for us uh, that is very important uh, both me and kiran like i said you know we have been working 25 years and uh, i i think we have seen a benefit of working together and uh, uh, like i said you know Uh, it is always and and the good part is we always complement and supplement uh, you give example of pair programming uh, the the benefit of pair programming i think are known by people that you you the chances of making mistakes are very minimal uh, you also uh, have an uh, trust and verify kind of uh, methodology so i think between the two of us we are very clear that how this can work and it also helps us to really scale especially when things are at scale when you have to build Uh, a massive applications in the shortest possible time trying to drive it i don't think so an individual can do that uh, justice uh, no individual uh, whether it is me individually or for that matter kiran individually uh, we cannot do it but i think collectively the the two of us between two of us uh, we 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 share responsibility uh, i i think that the good part is that we we know our limitations uh, very clearly uh, kiran is is a, a person who goes in very depth Uh, i like wit and i think uh, the together of us we cover the entire uh, square so i think i think that to me is 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 complimentary is is really helping us in building things which are uh, at agile uh, things which i miss out uh, i always know that you know there is someone like kiran who is going to uh, uh, talk about it and ask the question so that's why sometimes you know i start with some point and then he picks up saying that okay this point is what anish is making but uh this was something which we need to add to it or vice versa so i think i always see a benefit of working uh, uh in in uh, together because uh, it helps to scale it helps to really pace out things in fact it also helps to sometimes work breakdown uh, so that you know uh, we can share uh, work among each other so that the load sharing happens more, more effectively i mean mechanically as you know uh, anything on single uh, uh pillar versus uh, dual pillar the load can be shared and you can take more load so i think that that applies to both of us and that's how we uh, try to work with each other and that's how we uh, try to uh, complement each other uh, supplement each other at times uh, we also challenge each other i mean there are things where we challenge because and i think uh, that challenging is very important because once you challenge i think your mind starts uh, uh, thinking uh, something which you might have not thought so so that really helps and i think this has been for last 25 years and now it comes very natural we don't even think about it <laughs> yeah, amazing amazing so so this is this is pairing in practice at a leadership level and uh, this is this is the other element of again talib's book about building redundancy in some sense right like where you have uh, you know like load balancing if, if there was one person and uh, <laughs> if that uh, event had to uh, not have that person then the event would have been a, a little uh, problematic but at least between the two of us i spoke to him and he said uh, on my behalf and i said great <laughs> <laughs> ex- ex- excellent example of uh, something in live in action how the redundancy helps so brilliant brilliant uh i i'm little conscious about the time that we have left uh you know and i i'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a decision to maybe shoot a little over time by 2 3 minutes uh you know just because we lost in between 
So uh, I just have last two questions that I would uh, probably like to get to uh, in just in this flow as we are going through. So one thing that, uh, you know, is common now uh, because of the pandemic is working remotely uh, and working remotely uh, for a software company is, is, is understandable. I mean, we are used to that. But uh, Geo is a different ball game. I mean, you have such a massive footprint in terms of infrastructure, uh, hardware, uh, you're manufacturing your own phones, uh, you know, uh, and of course the entire network stack all the way coming to the software side of things. So uh, it's a massive footprint spread across, uh, I don't know how many locations in India. Uh, and when when the decision was made to, to work remotely, uh, how, how did you manage it? Very good question. I would say that uh, a very relevant, very good. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, uh, I think this is one of the greatest example of uh, doing things at scale uh, and at pace. Because sometimes uh, you, when you do at scale, uh, you miss out the pace. And uh, when you do at pace, you miss out the scale. Uh, so I, I think doing things uh, both at scale and pace uh, is, is probably this one example. Uh, as you rightly said, you know, we have more than 50,000 uh, locations from where we operate. Uh, we have people uh, uh, look at, looking at different different uh, areas. Uh, it could be a remote store. It could be uh, uh, our uh, data center. It could be uh, our warehouse. It could be uh, even our remote office. It could be a geo center. We have close to around uh, 10,000 geo centers, uh, 15,000 geo points, uh, uh, close to around 10,000 uh, retail stores. Uh, massive thing. And each locations uh, have to be connected because... Uh, without which uh, they can't operate uh, today everything is digital uh, whether it is our applications uh, collaboration access in fact every office every place uh, is well connected uh, and obviously we have to because otherwise we can't operate uh, when we had to move uh, remote uh, and this was probably uh, somewhere in uh, 2019 when uh, it was decided in march that you know uh, we can't continue to work from office uh, it was only 15 days uh, that we had to uh, migrate everybody from office to uh, whichever place they were working from, uh, providing uh, connectivity. Uh, and, and we have uh, close to around uh, uh, 12,000 uh, 24 by 7 field force, uh, sorry, uh, uh, force which is sitting in our uh, uh, Reliance Corporate Park, uh, who had to operate uh, all of a sudden uh, from their homes. Uh, no access to uh, any of our office uh, infrastructure. Uh, in 15 days, I think we were able to scale up everything, whether it was VPN, uh, whether it was uh, remote access, applications which were not uh, remote ready, uh, uh, and uh, uh, with, with the help of our InfoSec team, our network team, we were able to turn around overnight. Of course, we had got a lot of support from our partners like Cisco and Citrix and everybody to really make it happen overnight. I mean, this was this was something which uh, people were thinking what to do. And by that time, we had already thought about saying that this is have to have to be done. Uh, let me give one very, uh, very, very specific example, which is uh, directly impacting to our customers. Uh, because of uh, pandemic, uh, all our uh, eight call centers or contact centers, which were there distributed in different states, uh, had to be shut off. Now, uh, one of the important change, uh, challenge, and I think this challenge was for, with many other uh, uh, service providers. In fact, many other service providers had then contacted us uh, because we were able to do it in less than two weeks. Uh, and and this, is, this is a real story I would like to talk about, that in less than two weeks, 100% of our call center or contact center staff started operating from their home uh, using a smartphone at, uh, and a thin client, uh, thin client is, uh, it doesn't have any compute, but a very uh, one screen and one small box uh, connected to a 4G dongle, uh, accessing 100% of all our uh, contact center applications, including their uh, attendance, presence, a nice logger, recording, everything. You were able to turn around, and this was probably, I would say, the best uh, agile uh, example of converting uh, probably an app into uh, whatever uh, uh, from a native form or a uh, on-premise form to a remote uh, form uh, in 15 days flat. And 100% of our staff call centers were 
fully functional fully functional from their remote homes including the the, the supervisors were able to monitor uh, these people uh, from their home uh, i don't think so uh, many people were able to correlate or understand but most of the service industry will realize that this is a mammoth task to migrate 100% of close to around 20000 employees in a span of 15 days uh, giving them smartphone uh, giving them thin clients uh, connecting on 4g dongle uh, more more importantly getting all the applications uh, making it uh, remote access uh, asking our infosec guy to validate 100% uh, making our 24 by 7 ops team tech ops team to do it one of the uh, classic thing which our teams did and i think thanks to uh, my team uh, bp singh and and his uh, his uh, platform team who have built what we call ai ops ai ops is all about operations uh, and now he's of course getting into zero touch ops but ai ops is uh, with minimal set of people and probably we had less than 10 people uh, for whom we had got a permission to be stationed in office 100% of the staff was operating remotely from their home uh, managing 24 by, by 7 all our cloud native applications our on premise applications including our network infrastructure and not uh, uh, accessing all the applications remotely i think it was probably uh, something which was uh, act orchestrated the best way uh, all teams came collectively together and uh, a couple of my program managers and couple of my team leads uh, were program managing this on a day to day basis coming coming collectively and it was a it was a i would say the brilliant uh, program management ex, uh, uh, work which was done in in span of 15 days where nobody felt any downtime any service uh, downtime or any uh, service degradation uh, to the end customer or to our internal users or for that matter to uh, any of the stakeholders so i would say that uh, remote has actually helped to build some of our ip in fact now we are able to offer this as a service to many of our enterprise customers uh, that uh, you know how can they run in fact now we have given away our actual property the call center contact center property which we have hired we have already given away because we believe that even after pandemic is out uh, or we are resuming our office we don't want to go back to uh, contact center it has worked so very well for our agents supervisors uh, for the team uh, and they are so very productive because they don't have to travel uh, they are able to access all the information they are able to fulfill all the work uh, uh, this is something which we have built in 15 days i am very proud to say that you know this is now a service which we are offering to a lot of our customers so i would say remote in many sense has really helped us to innovate and to really bring uh, some of the best element of uh, working uh, together in more collaborative way than what would have i mean one of the classic example is launch of our geophone next and many uh, similar launches of our applications and services have happened in pandemic probably the amount of uh, launches which we have done in pandemic the number of features we have released the entire geomart and geomeet was launched in pandemic geomart was not existing before june of 20 uh, 19 uh, 2020 it, it started in july of 2020 and today uh, we have close to around half a million orders coming daily on geomart it was launched in in pandemic so imagine the kind of thing we were able to do by sitting remotely i believe that uh, if we work hybrid uh, probably uh, the, the opportunities are far more than what one would have imagined great great i remember the chairman the other day mentioning that if uh, now for a year we we we've, we've not only survived but uh, thrived in this environment is there a reason to go back and that's <laughs> that's that's pretty phenomenal uh, i know anish you, you are a very very busy man so i've uh, taken a lot of time but uh, if if you don't mind one last question i want to squeeze in uh, okay. every person i meet uh, and they come to know I am associated with Geo. The first question they ask me <laughs> inevitably is, uh, you know, as, as everyone knows, basically during the pandemic in the shortest duration ever, Geo was able to convince uh, top investors, tech, tech giants like uh, Facebook or Meta now, uh, Google, you know, Intel, a whole bunch of them to invest, uh, you know, $21 uh, billion into Geo Platform Limited. 
and the and the promise to them was about a unifying uh, geo platforms vision uh, so the question that everyone keeps asking me is you know how did they convince to 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 the investors to pour in this kind of a money so if you can just touch upon that and we'll wrap up then okay i think uh, it's it's a pretty <laughs> intense question but uh, uh, let me try to uh, give some glimpse of what it is i mean of course uh, there's a lot of secret sauce but it's an open secret and i think i don't mind uh, giving glimpse of what how how and what are the elements of why uh, 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 this has happened so first of all i think uh, it is very important that uh, you you should first get convinced yourself if you are not convinced i don't think so anybody else you can convince i mean this is a belief this is a fundamental belief in us uh, we do this all the time we want to eat our dog food first if we are not satisfied we don't want to even offer to anybody there are several examples internally where we have done so many work which we don't even offer because we ourselves are not satisfied and until we are not satisfied we don't want to take it anywhere i think this truthfulness this sincerity for us is what we transparently uh, share it with others that if we don't believe in ourselves i don't think so we can make anybody else to believe in us this is one very fundamental principle on which i think everybody else has got convinced because we were convinced very much we from i think straight uh, probably in 2010 when uh, kiran was the first employee of jio not many people might know but he was the first employee who migrated to jio uh, and i i moved uh, uh, a year after him uh, almost year and half after him joined him uh, but uh, since then we were very clear that we don't want to be in telecom we want to be a a, a platform company we want to really do that and uh, almost since 10 to i think in 19 we formed the geo platform for 9 years we were only uh, talking about it we were actually building about it uh, silently saying that you know uh, our platforms have to make sense before we go and expose it to anybody 9 uh, years is a, is a is a is a hell lot of a, a gestation period for somebody internally to get convinced and until we were convinced i don't think so we exposed ourselves to anybody so to me i think that truthfulness that sincerity to yourself if you do it i think everybody else will realize it because uh, we have to first be truthful and sincere to ourselves and if we are in 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 the right sense then i'm sure uh, we open it up and then people can judge us to say that whatever they are saying they are actually delivering it and i think this has been track record for reliance in last uh 40 years that we have been existing uh, whatever we have said uh, whatever we have committed and i think you can look at all the agms uh, speeches of uh, mba and whatever he has committed we have delivered we have delivered not only on what he has said but we have most of the time delivered on time now that uh, to me is is far more uh, sincere convincing and truthful effort of delivering to ourselves before we do it for others so i would leave with this last point saying that if anybody wants to get there i think first you have to convince yourself before you convince anybody else okay great uh, that's that's a, that's such a powerful message there uh, anish i think you know being convinced yourself and being truthful about it uh, is the first step and then obviously others will uh, see it and realize it and that's kind of uh, and again been a track record for you guys so uh, again i want to congratulate uh, you and the entire team for what you've been able to accomplish uh, putting us on the global road map and also changing the landscape of the Uh, entire india digital story in in such a short span so uh, again amazing job and thank you so much for joining us thank you very much uh, this for me was uh, uh, something first time i have done uh, individually so i definitely miss kiran and i just want to say that on behalf of myself and kiran i thank to you naresh and uh, it has been great uh, two years and i believe uh, that you know that two years looks to me like 20 years of our uh, association and uh, i wish that and i want to continue this uh, as long as we work together so this is something i i, I want to uh, uh, to congratulate you and your team for a wonderful session like this thank you very much
so again i didn't get into introductions about anish or any of that stuff uh, you know because I, i'm hoping you've already read his profile he's uh, you know someone who really calls the shots at at geo he's he's kind of the go to man uh, and so uh, i thought it would be great to kind of uh, based on my experience pick specific aspects and kind of go a little bit into it and keep it a very open and honest discussion cool yeah okay perfect thank you i see all the comments hopefully anish can join back uh, quickly and then uh, we have few more interesting surprises for him uh, and we'll go through that